NASA uncovers Mars troubles, Starliner gets stacked for launch, and SpaceX reaches 20 flights with a Falcon 9 booster. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 19th of April, our one-year anniversary, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. By now, you've probably seen the story about the piece of space junk that hit a house last month. Now don't worry, that's not normal, you don't need to buy a big umbrella to cover your house or anything. But as rare of an event that it was, it was quite a hit, and this week NASA confirmed that it was indeed a piece of its own space junk. The piece was part of a cargo pallet carrying a set of old ISS batteries that were removed and changed out for newer ones. This was part of a major overhaul of the station's power systems from nickel hydride batteries to newer and more efficient lithium ion batteries. During this overhaul, new batteries are launched on a pallet within JAXA's HTV spacecraft. These are then installed, then the pallet is filled with the older batteries, returned to the HTV spacecraft that brought it up, and it safely disposes of the batteries and the pallet without any harm. So what went wrong? Well, this cargo pallet in particular was the one brought up to the station on the HTV-9 mission, the last HTV mission to the ISS until the upcoming HTV-X spacecraft launches next year. The pallet had been stored on the exterior of the station until March 11, 2021, at which point it was released. At the time of release, the pallet, with the old batteries on board, had a mass of approximately 2,630 kilograms. Atmospheric drag eventually made its orbit decay and re-enter, bringing it in for re-entry on March 8, 2024. While most of it was expected to burn up, one piece survived and made it down to the ground, hitting a house in Naples, Florida. NASA retrieved the piece and concluded that it was a stanchion from the flight support equipment used to mount the batteries to the pallet. The stanchion was a 725-gram Inconel cylinder, about 10 centimeters tall and 4 centimeters in diameter, and this unexpected hit will now give NASA more data to re-examine and study in depth as to what happens to certain space hardware when it re-enters the atmosphere from orbit. Now, there is a much longer story to all of this, though. I mentioned that the plan to change the batteries on the ISS had the cargo pallets coming back to Earth on the same HTV spacecraft that had launched them, disposing of them safely. So why was the HTV-9 cargo pallet still on the ISS? Well, it's kind of a long story. In September of 2018, the HTV-7 spacecraft launched with its own pallet loaded with batteries. Nick Haig, part of the crew of the Soyuz MS-10 mission, was scheduled to perform the very intricate spacewalk needed to replace these batteries. Unfortunately, his flight was cut short due to an abort two minutes into the launch. This meant that when the HTV-7 spacecraft had to leave the station, it couldn't carry back the cargo pallet that it had brought up with any old batteries because they hadn't been changed yet. NASA made the decision to instead dispose of that pallet on the HTV-8 mission and dispose of HTV-8's pallet on HTV-9. So this is why the HTV-9 pallet was still on the station. It had carried back the pallet from the previous mission and it left its own up there. So as you can see, sometimes what seems like a pretty simple story actually has a lot more tucked away under its roof, like a chunk of metal from space. In the last few weeks, there have been a number of interesting developments coming from the Chinese spaceflight industry. Space Pioneer recently showed off progress towards the maiden flight of the company's Tianlong-3 rocket. This included completion of acceptance firing for all nine engines to be used on the first stage of the rocket, then they showed a picture of these engines installed on the engine section of the rocket, and, huh, as you can see, it's kind of a familiar view. Yep, the Tianlong-3 rocket will look pretty much like a Falcon 9 rocket. It even has similar performance and is being designed to have a reusable booster. These engines now integrated with the first stage will be test fired again all at once later this month in preparation for flight. Space Pioneer emphasizes that the debut flight of Tianlong-3 is still on track for this summer, so we'll have to wait and see what happens. Now on the other hand, there's Landspace, which is pushing through with development of its Zuke-3 rocket, another partially reusable rocket, but this one uses methane for fuel. The company is now officially starting to manufacture the stainless steel rings and barrel sections of the rocket's tanks. Landspace has also moved up the date for the debut flight of its rocket from late 2025 to mid-2025, which is interesting as it's something that doesn't happen very often in spaceflight. Development of the rocket must be going much faster than originally estimated if this is being accelerated by six months. And speaking of development, 
The company is putting final touches on its next vertical takeoff vertical landing vehicle demonstrator for Zuke 3. This test vehicle is a subscale version of what the rocket's booster will look like, and it's fitted with just one engine. Landspace already completed a hop test a few months ago, but it was only up to a few hundred meters in altitude. This one will instead be going to 10 kilometers, which is why this next vehicle will carry grid fins for aerodynamic control during the re-entry. This second hop is currently planned for July, so we'll be keeping an eye on whatever updates we get from it. Landspace also continues preparations for the next flight of its Zuke 2 rocket, which should be the fourth overall and the second operational flight. This flight will be carrying an upgraded second stage engine, derived from the first stage engine, but optimized for the vacuum of space. This engine and its niobium nozzle expansion have been tested on the ground ahead of flight. Meanwhile, on the moon, China's Chiachao-2 spacecraft has arrived at its lunar orbit around the moon and is functioning as expected, paving the way for the Chang'e 6 mission set to take place on May 3rd of this year. Every week, there's some drama in space, and this week, it's NASA's Mars Sample Return Mission. The mission has been in a pause for almost a year, mainly due to the problems encountered ever since serious work started on it back in early 2021. These problems were primarily budget and schedule related, which led NASA to set up an independent review board in order to identify the weaknesses of the program and estimate a more realistic budget and schedule. The result was devastating for the program, with costs expected to be in the range of $8 to $11 billion and a most likely date for the samples to return to Earth in 2035. NASA then had to take in all of these findings and come up with solutions, and, well, it kind of looks like the agency has run out of ideas. This week, NASA released its findings, and, after much deliberation, its best plan was to stretch the program in order to be able to afford spending those $8 to $11 billion on the mission, which means the likely date of return of samples would move even further back to 2040. This is a huge blow to the mission, and it puts it at serious risk of cancellation. But the agency does not want to give up on it, and it has very compelling reasons to keep up the effort. From science, to improving our knowledge about Mars ahead of future human flights, even including geopolitical strategy. NASA really wants to do this. But despite all that, changes are needed. The bottom line is that $11 billion is too expensive, and not returning samples until 2040 is unacceptably too long. That was the statement from NASA's administrator during a press conference this week about the mission. Also during it, NASA announced that it's opening a request for information to companies and other organizations to propose ideas to make the Mars sample return mission faster and cheaper. Proposals are due by May 17th, with 90-day studies set to go out shortly thereafter. NASA expects to choose a final proposal by fall that could finally put things back into gear by speeding up their timeline at a reduced cost. For this, the agency has accepted some sacrifices, for example, only retrieving 10 of Perseverance's 30 sample canisters, with samples from only the most interesting and promising locations. As could be expected, NASA was also asked about innovative solutions for landing on Mars, such as SpaceX's Starship. NASA's official position is that it's preferable if these proposals use as much proven technology as possible to shorten development and construction timelines and lower potential budgets. But despite that, the official request for information that the agency sent out does not forbid wild architectures introducing new elements into the mission. In fact, the document states that the agency would be interested in potentially having a smaller Mars ascent vehicle or a complete alternative to it. SpaceX's CEO Elon Musk quickly went on to social media to claim that Starship could do this mission in five years. But, well, Elon's timelines aren't always the most realistic, and to be fair, timelines in spaceflight do tend to slip a lot. This mission's probably going to generate a lot more debate and discussion in the coming weeks and months as proposals pop up left and right, and also as we learn which proposals are chosen to proceed through to the end. It'll be interesting to see what solution, though, if any, comes up, but whatever happens, it's gonna be tough. There is one really good question to be asked here, though, which is why did it take so long for NASA to realize that its architecture wasn't suited to this? And also, why didn't it open up proposals for it a lot sooner? If this request had gone out years ago, we might be a lot closer to having a Mars sample return mission taking place. Not only has it been delayed heavily, but it's also endangered other science missions like Dragonfly, Veritas, and more. It's no wonder that it's become a tough choice for NASA to make. The wait may soon be over. Starliner is officially on top of an Atlas V, and it's preparing to take astronauts to the International Space Station. 
The Starliner spacecraft for Boeing's crew flight test, nicknamed Calypso, was rolled out from the commercial crew and cargo processing facility in the early hours of Tuesday, April 16th. It then made a 16-kilometer excursion past the Vehicle Assembly Building and was taken to United Launch Alliance's Vertical Integration Facility at Space Launch Complex 41. Here it was officially integrated on top of the mighty Atlas V for what will likely be the final time before flight. The mission, set for May 7th, will be Starliner's first ever crewed mission after two previous uncrewed flight tests. Astronauts Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore will be test flying the vehicle and watching over the systems as Starliner plans to fly and dock to the ISS autonomously. Both astronauts have a rich history of spaceflight with missions on the space shuttle and Soyuz and long-term stays on the ISS. They're set to arrive at the Kennedy Space Center next Thursday to undergo pre-launch work. This will include a dry dress rehearsal, with the crew being transported to the pad following the same countdown and timing as the day of launch. This flight will feature an Atlas V in the N-22 configuration, with the N standing for no fairing, the first two representing two solid rocket boosters, and the final two representing the two Centaur engines that will take the crew to space. Boeing has stated that a successful mission will create an easy path for Starliner to officially be certified by NASA for regular flights to and from the ISS. Such regular flights wouldn't happen until early next year, though, when the station's crew schedule would allow such a flight to take place. There will likely be many updates on this upcoming mission to come, and you can be sure that we'll keep you informed on everything that happens from now until the launch. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Ariane 6 has officially passed all of its qualification tests for its inaugural flight. Back on April 12th, the final hot firing test of Ariane 6's upper stage was completed at the German Aerospace Center. This comes after the successful long-duration firing of the core stage in November of 2023, as well as a full countdown sequence of the launch site and many other demonstration tests. These tests have paved the way for the maiden flight of the Ariane 6 rocket later this summer. This last upper stage test involved firing the upper stage under non-nominal conditions to gather further data on how the vehicle responds to potential abnormalities during flight. This test was supposed to be completed late last year, but it was aborted early into firing. Now that it's complete, it finally puts a nice bow on what has been a long development road for Ariane 6. This week, Perseverance waved a final goodbye to its buddy Ingenuity. The rover is now exiting the area of direct line of communications with the Mars helicopter, which means no more data will come from it for a long time, maybe even forever. However, that doesn't mean that Ingenuity won't be doing anything anymore. Just last month, we had Dr. Travis Brown, chief engineer for the Mars helicopter, live here on NSF during our Intrepid Museum show, talking about the plans for Ingenuity once this happened. Eventually, the, the, the rover will trundle its way out of telecom range. And, and then you'll be, you know, yeah, that'll yeah. Be it. We, we are gonna store the data. So we, we recently did a flight software update so that the, the data doesn't get wiped. Um, and so we've got something like 20 years of storage space. So we'll just keep taking data every day for the next 20 years. And nice. if the rover comes back and we'll just pull all that data down, we'll have like five years of five, 10 years of solar trending, depending on when the rover comes through. Yeah, yeah. Still yeah. living on, that's amazing. Yeah, it's, still, it's, it's still alive. It's still doing it's science. Still, Somebody just needs yeah. to come visit it so we can get the results. So here's hoping we have the chance to reconnect with this little guy sometime in the future. NASA has officially confirmed Dragonfly, the rotorcraft for the one-of-a-kind mission to Saturn's moon Titan. With this confirmation, the mission, selected as part of NASA's New Frontiers program in 2019, can now continue on through the design finalization, construction, and testing ahead of launch. That launch, though, has seen delays in recent years due to funding constraints and the pandemic. For that reason, NASA has rescheduled it for launch in 2028, with its new landing on Titan now planned for 2034. This launch will now use a heavy lift launcher rather than a medium lift launcher, as originally planned, in order to accelerate the arrival time. Just like the schedule, the budget has also inflated to $3.35 billion, about twice the original budget estimate for this mission. Still not as wildly problematic as the Mars sample return mission discussed earlier, but it definitely reflects the complexity of sending a massive rotorcraft to such a distant location. Launch Complex 16 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station is actively being renovated to support Relativity Space's Terran R rocket. After the launch of Relativity's Terran 1 rocket on March 23, 2023 ended in failure, Relativity decided to go all in building Terran R. 
This rocket is much larger, so it'll need a larger pad for its operations. Well, this week, Relativity gave an update on the progress to modify LC-16 for Terran R. The launch area has been completely flattened for the larger launch pad to begin construction. Just about everything but the original Terran 1 horizontal integration facility, the concrete from the original pad, and the water farm has been cleared for upgrades. Relativity is already making way for the much larger horizontal integration facility needed for Terran R, just a few meters to the east of the existing one. Relativity's update also mentioned that waterline installation is now underway, so that seems to be the start of actual hardware for this pad now being put into place. We look forward to even more updates from Relativity on pad upgrades and continued work on the Terran R program. Now let's take a look at This Week in Launches. Starting off this week, we had a Falcon 9 launching on April 13th at 1.40 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The mission was carrying a batch of Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit. The booster used was B-1062, which was flying on its 20th flight. Yes, 20th flight! This makes it the first Falcon 9 booster to reach this milestone, and it did so just 28 days after its 19th flight. A very quick turnaround relative to other milestone flights performed before. B-1062 successfully returned, landing on SpaceX's drone ship a short fall of Gravitas. This launch also marked the fastest turnaround time for any SpaceX launch pad at just 68 hours between Starlink 648, the previous flight from this location, and this mission. From the other side of the world, we had the launch of a Changzheng 2D on April 15th at 412, taking place from the Zhouchuan Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket was carrying the Superview NEO 301 into a sun-synchronous orbit. The satellite is planned to be part of a constellation of 28 Superview satellites and was built by China Seaway Survey and Mapping Technology Company. It has 0.5 meters of imaging resolution over 9 wavelength bands and a 130 km imaging swath. After that, we had the second Starlink launch of the week, taking place on April 17th at 2126 UTC from Launch Complex 39A. Just like the recent Starlink launches, it was carrying 23 Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit. The booster for this mission, B-1077, was flying for a 12th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. For those keeping track, this was the 50th Starlink Group 6 mission, despite it being Starlink 651. SpaceX just hasn't launched 650 yet. And just yesterday night, we got another Starlink mission, Starlink Group 652, taking place on April 18th at 2240 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The first stage for this mission, B-1080, was flying for a seventh time, and it successfully landed on a short fall of Gravitas. With the Starlink missions of this week, SpaceX has now launched a total of 6,258 Starlink satellites, of which 406 have re-entered, and 5,206 have moved into their operational orbit. And now, let's see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Next week, we'll have the launch of a Changzheng 2D rocket with a yet unknown payload. Liftoff from Xichang is set to take place on April 20th at 2345 UTC. After that, there will be another Falcon 9 launch from Florida. The four-hour launch window opens on April 22nd at 2240 UTC. From the other side of the world, we'll have Rocket Lab's Electron rocket launching from New Zealand. The mission, called Beginning of the Swarm, will be carrying a pair of satellites into low Earth orbit, including NASA's next solar sail mission. The 75-minute launch window opens on April 23rd at 2130 UTC. China's next crewed mission to the Tiangong Space Station is set for next week, carrying another trio of Chinese astronauts into orbit. The Shenzhou-18 mission is set to lift off on board a Changzheng 2F rocket on April 25th at around 12.59 UTC, docking about three hours later to the nadir port of the station's Tianhe module. Right around that time, and from the other space station, the ISS, we'll have a Russian spacewalk. Cosmonauts Oleg Kononenko and Nikolai Chub are set to exit the orbiting outpost on April 25th at 14.55 UTC to conduct work on the Russian side of the station for about seven hours. And for the 52nd time, that's your weekly update of Spaceflight News! This show turns one year old today, so a big thank you to everyone who's been watching and supporting from the beginning. And as always, we'll see you all next week to recap this week in Spaceflight.